Exploring the ocean has been part of human culture and society for a very long time. Even today, a lot of adventure travel is all about experiencing the ocean. This picture is from a multi-day ocean kayaking trip I did out in British Columbia in a place called Johnstone Strait. The site is really well known for getting up close to some very impressive marine mammals such as humpback whales, Pacific white-sided dolphins, and even orcas. But ocean kayaking comes with its dangers. Water temperatures here, even in the summer, are only in the mid to upper 50s. That means hypothermia is a big risk if you're in the water too long. So why do we go out there? Why do we want to explore the oceans? That's going to be our topic for today. Before we get started, I want to pay attention to the significant ideas that are going to override our talk today. I want you to focus on how ocean exploration over time has influenced human development, especially when we talk about food, transportation, and technology. We're also going to look at how we actually learn about the oceans. What are some of the data collection methods that we can use today and what are their strengths and weaknesses? And of course, it's always good to look over the specific learning goals and targets that we're trying to achieve today. I want you to be able to list significant reasons for early ocean exploration, discuss some of the more important discoveries made through ocean exploration, and contrast some of the various methods of modern ocean exploration that we use today. So let's get started. Now we could spend a lot of time with the individual cultures and societies around the world and how they interacted with the ocean, but we're not going to do that. We're going to try and simplify things into why collectively civilizations over time explored the ocean. There are three major interconnected reasons for this, and all of them are based off of human needs. To start off with, we need food, and the oceans provide that as a resource. Everything from actual fish to clams and, and crabs and lobsters, we have a lot of options out there. Early on, building boats probably facilitated accessing food and fishing. But once people started sailing, all of a sudden, other opportunities opened up. You could transport goods and resources from one place to another. You could trade those resources with other communities. And eventually, you could also find new lands to colonize. The benefits of exploring the ocean drove innovation. And then the boats became more sturdy, more dependable, and they could travel farther. As the desire to explore increased, so did the technology that allowed it. Soon, it wasn't just about building ships, it was also about understanding tides and currents, observing marine life to find out where are the best places to access food, um, and understand geography by creating charts to find out where things were in relation to each other. Along the way, there were some pretty significant developments in terms of technology that allowed ocean exploration to flourish. Interestingly, a lot of them were discovered by the Greeks. They were the first to actually understand that the Earth was actually a sphere through using not only their maps, but also mathematics. This knowledge, of course, was lost through the Middle Ages, but eventually was rediscovered later on. The Greeks also predicted tides uh, by monitoring the moon phases and understanding the relationships therein. They were also able to actually calculate the circumference of the Earth and develop the first latitude and longitude systems. The Chinese actually developed the magnetic compass, and that was a game changer because you combine that with latitude and longitude systems and eventually an accurate chronometer where they could tell time accurately around the world, that allowed the kind of navigation that propelled people around the world. On Edmodo, I have a link to a little video that'll show you how these different components of technology were used to navigate the ocean. So go check it out. As we move a little further along into history, we're going to talk very briefly about some of the voyages of discovery that were made in science. 
James Cook was a well-known British explorer. He did multiple expeditions, and through those expeditions, were able to collect thousands of samples of plants, and not only natural observations, even astronomical observations. And those types of voyages really laid a foundation to our current understanding of the oceans. James Cook actually met an untimely end in Hawaii. I actually got to visit the site in which he was killed. If you're interested in the story, go check it out online. It's actually kind of curious. The voyage of the HMS Beagle is, of course, very well known for Charles Darwin. Throughout that voyage, he put together information that led him to his theory of natural selection, which was a game changer for biology. Along the way, he actually also documented the formation of coral reef atolls in the Pacific. As time went on, even more expeditions continued to gather data. The U.S. Exploring Expedition in 1838 confirmed a landmass in Antarctica. Matthew Murray is actually known as the father of physical oceanography. He was a U.S. naval officer, but early on he actually uh, sustained a leg injury that made him unfit for seafaring. That didn't stop him, however. He spent a lot of time going over all the nautical charts and data that came in and eventually published a book called Physical Geography of the Sea. This stands at the foundation of modern oceanography. The Challenger expedition was the first completely devoted to marine science and collect thousands of new species that nobody had ever seen before. The Meteor expedition, which was German, in 1925 mapped the Atlantic seafloor for the first time with echo sounding data. The first ship built specifically for science was the Atlantis and it actually confirmed the presence of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And the second Challenger expedition in 1951 located the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench, and it's still the deepest part known today. Eventually, there became a need for a more focused study of the ocean and that led to the development of various oceanographic institutes around the world. Some big examples are the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which started in 1930, and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in 1912. This leads us to today. How do we explore the oceans in the 21st century? In some ways, time hasn't changed much. There is still a lot of research that happens right along the shoreline or in near-shore habitats. In fact, this is the type of research you will be doing this year. Even with all the technology we have, humans still interact more with these coastal regions than any other marine habitat on the planet. It's easy to access and usually has very minimal costs. There's also generally a low risk factor in terms of our actively being out in these habitats. There are, however, some major limitations. The vast majority of the ocean still remains inaccessible from the shoreline. The pictures on this slide show you some of the activities you're going to have the opportunity to be a part of this year. Now as fun as actually going out and doing field work is, lab work is still important. By running experiments in laboratories, we're able to control variables much more efficiently than in the field. Lab work is also generally less expensive than field work, and has less risk. Major drawbacks, however, is that it's really hard to understand a complex natural system when you're just dealing with a few variables in a lab. However, it is a way to help determine some of the basic physical and chemical properties of the ocean, not to mention study some of the behavioral and physiological characteristics of marine animals that would really be impossible in the field you will most definitely be trying out some of these techniques here in this class this year. Just like the voyages of discovery in the past, being out on a research vessel allows you to access a majority of the surface of the ocean. Through various tasks that we call surface ops, we are able to really get good data from a variety of depths just from working from the ship. We can employ sonar, uh, to map the topography of the ocean floor. We can use various sampling nets, like trawl nets, at depth to collect organisms and bring them up to the ship for investigation. We can drop sensors that will give us chemical and physical profiles of the water 
at a variety of depths as well. From the decks of these vessels, we can launch ROVs and AUVs, which are unmanned exploration tools. ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, and it's generally tethered by an umbilical to the ship and directly controlled by scientists. AUVs are autonomous unmanned vehicles, and they are not connected to the ship. They can be programmed with a particular profile and, and mission and sent off to do their tasks. Of course, if you want to really send scientists underwater, you have to use submersibles or underwater habitats. There are a variety of submersibles working today around the world that can access a variety of depths. The picture on the top left shows a relatively new submersible used by James Cameron and his crew to reach the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. Most submersibles don't go that deep. Generally, they bottom out around 20,000 feet. The picture on the top right is the old Johnson Sealing submersibles that ran out of Fort Pierce at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. I got the chance to go down in this submersible to about 3,000 feet, which is its max depth. It's really a thrill to be able to go down and explore in person, but of course submersibles have their drawbacks. They cost tens of thousands of dollars a day to run, and of course there is a human risk factor. There is another option, of course, and that's permanent underwater habitats. This is the Aquarius Reef Base that's off of Key Largo in about 60 feet of water. This allows scientists to live multi-day expeditions studying the underwater habitat. If you're going to do research underwater, scuba diving is a lot more accessible to most scientists than submersibles or underwater habitats. Generally, this limits you to about the first 100 feet of the ocean, although you can go deeper in certain circumstances. The picture on the top right there is actually me hovering next to a big coral head in the Keys. And of course, I've got to give a big shout out to Jacques Cousteau and Emile Gagnon, who invented the Aqualung in 1943 which essentially is what we use for scuba diving today. Scuba diving basically relies on a tank which contains compressed air. Through a series of regulators, the air is brought to the ambient pressure so that you can breathe it at depth. Scuba divers also wear a BCD, or a buoyancy compensation device. It's kind of like a vest that's connected to the air tank. You can increase or decrease the air in the vest and thus allowing you to reach neutral buoyancy wherever you're at. A series of gauges helps you identify how much air you have left and the depth that you're at. Although scuba diving can be a very safe sport, each year people die because they don't follow the rules and don't understand what they're doing. If you want to scuba dive, you've got to take the course and get certified through the appropriate organizations like PADI or NAWI. Later on in the course, we'll talk about some of the physics that are actually involved and some of the risks associated with that when you're scuba diving. And yes, the picture on the right is me again. Of course, times they are changing. With satellite technology exploding across the marine science field, we are gathering more data than ever before. Satellites can provide real-time extensive data on a lot of various aspects of the ocean, including sea level rise, sea level temperatures, even tides. And of course, once you have the satellite up, you don't even have to go through the expense of getting out on a ship and going out on the ocean. Another relatively new thing that we're doing is tracking various marine life. One of the most well-publicized versions of this has to do with sharks. An organization called OSEARCH has been satellite tagging great white sharks, among other species, and publishing this data online. You can see one of the maps from a shark named Catherine to the right, and yes, she swam right by our beaches. This technique has also been used with other species, such as sea turtles, which are giving us amazing data that we've never been able to get before. The truth is, most of the ocean is still a mystery to us, even with all of the different methods that we have to study it. We've only explored about 1% of the ocean bottom. Considering over 70% of the Earth's surface is ocean, that's not a lot. So if you're interested in becoming a marine scientist, don't worry. There's plenty left to discover out there. 
So now I throw it back to you. We've talked about how our relationship between the ocean and technology evolved early on. So what's going to happen in the future? The picture on the right is a dream. Could we live on floating ocean colonies or even submarine colonies on the ocean floor? What do you think? How do you think our continued exploration of the ocean will affect the technology of the future? Make sure to respond to this on your topic summaries.